are going to cover the preface this morning, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And basically the overall idea is this, the certainty of what has been received. And Paul, uh, Luke is writing to Theophilus. And basically he wants to firm up the, the things that Theophilus had received as he was further taught. I put this secondary thought up here, an impregnable historical foundation. And we've seen that as we walked through this last week. <clears throat> and we'll see that again as we walk through Luke's gospel, that he grounds these things in historical Events, if you will, we see it in chapter 1, verse 5, again chapter 2, at the beginning of the chapter, and then again in chapter 3, as we have the inauguration of John the Baptist's ministry. But I wanted to show you again, when we look at this, this is the first major section in Luke's Gospel. And it's very interesting because when you look at uh, Acts, which is the, the second part to this, if you will, in Acts, Luke likes to give us these summary statements which sum up the previous section, but also sort of intro what is to come. And he does a similar thing here in the first couple chapters of his gospel. And it's interesting that as we walk through this, we'll see these sort of summary statements. The narrative begins in chapter 1, verse 5. <clears throat> and the intro stands off by itself, and we'll look at why in just a moment. But he begins everything in chapter 1, verse 5. He fixes it in the historical context. In the days of Herod, or in the Herod days, the days that are characterized by Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias. So he, he grounds this in the time of, of Herod. But notice we have the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist, or the conception of John the Baptist. We have the announcement in chapter 1, verse 26 and following, of the conception of Christ. And then we have chapter 1, verses 39 and following, where Mary goes and visits with Elizabeth, and then you have this summary statement of 156. Notice this, and Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. Now this is interesting because this, this gives us a, a place of reference for where Mary is. She is now back at home. She had visited with Elizabeth. She was there for three months up until the time that Elizabeth was going to give birth to John. Mary then returns home and there she will stay until chapter 2. Notice in chapter 2, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth, talking about the entire Roman Empire at the time. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David." And he did this, verse 5, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. Now, while they are there, <clears throat> it says, verse 6, that while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So we have that summary statement back in chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 56, where Mary returns home until the time that that decree is, is given by Caesar Augustus, and then she journeys with Joseph to go and to register, and that is where Christ is born. Not at her home, but here in a strange village, in a strange place, surrounded by not friends and relatives like Elizabeth, but you have shepherds and others who come at the birth of the child. But notice with me then, we have the birth of, of John the Baptist that happens <clears throat> in chapter 1, verse 57. And then we have, in verses 67 through 79, we have this prophetic hymn, if you will, from Zacharias, John's father, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But notice chapter 1, verse 80. Here's another summary statement. And the child continued to grow and to become strong in spirit, and he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So we have this sort of summary statement here as John is left in the wilderness. Here he waits until the time that God would have him be revealed to the nation of Israel. And then if you move with me to chapter 3. <clears throat> so here you have just John sort of fades out of the background. We have a summing up of sort of this is what happened in the course of his life. This is where he is waiting now for his revelation, God to reveal him to the nation of Israel. Notice in chapter 3, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Iduria, Trachanitus, Licinius, 
it was Tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Now it picks up again that John was in the wilderness. Now the word comes to him while he's in the wilderness. <clears throat> and it came, he came into the district, verse 3, around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And so now it's time for John to begin his ministry. Notice with me, <clears throat> again in chapter 2, so we had the, the, the announcement of John's birth, the announcement of Christ's birth, the summary statement. We have John's birth and then the summary statement. Now we have Christ's birth in chapter 2. He's presented in the temple in chapter 2, starting in verse 21. And we'll look at that in a little more detail next Sunday. But he's presented in the temple, and this is where he, you know, Simeon and Anna come, and they, Simeon prophesies in regards to this child. Anna, she's joyful, and, and she goes to tell everyone about the fact that the redemption has come to Israel. But notice this in, in verse 39 and 40. Here's another summary statement. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now the interesting thing with Christ's a section here that deals with the, the birth of Christ, and then they return home, you have the summary statement. That's not where it ends. Notice there's another summary statement that comes. Notice in chapter 2, verse 52, there is a secondary summary statement that talks about the growth of Christ, of Jesus. Notice in verse 52, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. The interesting thing is that in chapter 2, verses 41 through 52, parallels chapter 1, verse 80 in regards to John the Baptist. Because here we have Christ that he makes this revelation in the temple to his parents in the end of chapter 2. And it says, verse 51, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, talking about Jesus going with his parents. And he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men until the time for his appearance, until the time for him to begin his ministry. So all the way through the first two chapters, we have this, these, this paralleling going on between John and Jesus. We also have these summary statements that prepare us for what is to come in, in the advancement of the story, if you will, in the advancement of this gospel narrative. The interesting thing is that in chapter 2, verses 41 through 52, <clears throat> begins a new section, if you will, in this gospel narrative. And we'll talk about the reason why, but it's interesting. You can even see that just in the summary statements. You have the first summary statement in chapter 2, verses 39 and 40. You have a secondary one, almost repeating the same things in verse 52. Why is that? Because this section, chapter 2, verses 41 and following, it is a part of the next major section of this gospel narrative. And we'll see what it deals with because... What we try to do when we study through a gospel is to understand how the different episodes connect together. Oftentimes we, we tend to look at the gospels, whether it's Matthew, Mark, John, whatever, Luke. We tend to look at, at these different episodes in isolation from everything around them. They're all connected together. There's an overriding theme, if you will, oftentimes with these episodes. And with Luke's, it's fascinating because oftentimes the final episode is sort of the punchline to the whole series of episodes. And we saw this in the progression of the hymns in chapter 2, right? From Mary's to Zacharias's, then to Simeon's. And we'll look at Simeon's a little bit more fully next week. So this is the, the major section, chapter, chapter 1, verse 5, through chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 40, where we have the summary statement. Chapter 2, verse 41, we'll begin our next section, and we'll look at that. And we'll also see that there are things introduced to us in the first two chapters that prepare us for what is to come. We'll see this in Simeon's prayer and also prophecy, that it also prepares us for what is going to come in relation to Christ's ministry and also the sections that are to follow. But this morning I wanted to look at the preface to the gospel. I really couldn't move on without dealing with this because it's a very fascinating passage. And we don't have time to, to look at every little detail in regards to the first four verses. But just so you understand what Luke is doing here, we understand that what he is trying to establish. There are several things we're going to look at. First, the literary context, and this is significant. This introduction stands out from all the other gospels. And it stands out from any other writing we have in the New Testament. Also, we'll look at the motivation or justification for his writing in chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. 
We will look at his purpose in verse 4, and then the motivation and purpose in writing being fulfilled. And we'll look at how Luke establishes what he, what he desires to do and his purpose for writing in 1 through 4, and then we'll look at how he sort of brings this out. And we see this carried out in the first two chapters, at least what we've seen last week. First, the literary context. <clears throat> Several things. The preface in relation to literature as a whole. This to me is very fascinating, and, and I'll you know discuss some things here this morning that to me are, are amazing to me. And that they may not be to you, but I'll just tell you and put it out there. But to me, it's very fascinating. Some of the things that take place in, in this first few verses of Luke's gospel. But unlike the other evangelists, Luke begins his gospel narrative with a brief preface, much like one would find in the work of contemporary studied secular writer. And it's very interesting because chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it is very excellent Greek, if you will. And it is, in a sense, very secular. The thing that makes it stand out as being religious is the mention of, in verse 2, he says, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the Word. That sets this off from being just merely a, a secular work. This is a religious work. This is dealing with the issue of Christianity. The Word here in verse 2, as he makes a statement with the article, the Word, he's talking about the Gospel. But what's interesting is that you would find this preface in many works in the time of Luke, historical works, if you will, or official works. The classical style of this opening preface is similar to the style that you would find in writers such as Herodotus, who wrote about 424, 430 B.C. He was a Greek historian. <clears throat> Thucydides, which I give you the English trans, uh, pronunciation of that, but he wrote in the time of 401 B.C. He was also a Greek historian. Polybius, 200 to 118 B.C., also a Greek historian. All of these writers would use such a preface to preface their historical works. Now, this is significant to understand this because, again, what Luke is trying to establish is the certainty of what Theophilus has already been instructed in. He wants to show them that that is grounded upon a historical foundation, that what you have heard is historical fact, not fiction. So he begins his work, his gospel, like any other historical writer would. All right? But he's going to discuss the historical fact of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Among the words which are classical rather than biblical, and these, it's fascinating, there are words that only Luke uses in all the New Testament. He is the only one who uses these words. And it's, and it's interesting to me when we, we come to this, we'll talk about it, but it just we have to ask ourselves why. Why? Just use this one word this one time. There is significance in that. But among the words, inasmuch as, starting in chapter 1, verse 1, we have the word inasmuch as, have undertaken or taken to hand. We have the word to compile in proper order, to account, uh, to account or a narrative, to develop a narrative, if you will, in consecutive order. All these are terms that we would find in historical prefaces to historical works. And Luke uses these terms. They weren't part of common day, everyday language. They were a part of the literary language, if you will. This is what the, the, the writers would use. But we have to keep in mind, although Luke is going to use the conventions of his time, we need to understand that the resulting work that we have before us, this gospel, is an expression of his own personality and his own purpose. He has a specific intent in mind when he writes this gospel. And the beautiful thing is he lets us know it right offhand. John is the only other writer that, that specifically states what his purpose is, but John doesn't even state his purpose till the end of his gospel. What's fascinating with John is that he talks about the signs of the miracles that he recorded, so you may know that Christ is the Son of God. What's interesting is he has a series of these miracles, and then he has episodes that are connected to those miracles that, that form a teaching, but he has a series of these miracles, and then he leads to the end where he gives his purpose statement. Here Luke gives his purpose up front for us. Notice this, the preface in relation to Luke and Acts. <clears throat> the third and fifth books of the New Testament, which are Luke and Acts, were designed not as two independent works, Luke and Acts, but they were rather designed to be two parts of a single work, Luke-Acts. In other words, when he started to write the gospel, he also intended to write Acts as well. And, but primarily, this introduction, 1, 1 through 4, it primarily serves as the introduction to the gospel, All right, but <clears throat> it relates to Acts as well. And if you turn with me to Acts, right after John chapter 21, Acts, we have sort of an intro, but it's just a, it's sort of 
not as extensive as the one we have in Luke's Gospel. So that intro in Luke's Gospel sort of covers both of them, but primarily it's focusing on the Gospel narrative. But notice in Acts, and he says, The first account, chapter 1, verse 1, The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. And remember when we had the two on the road to Emmaus, and they come across Christ, and they mention the prophet who was mighty, what? In deed and in word. So we have these different connections that come in the first few verses of Acts that connect it to Luke's gospel, and very intimately so. But notice this verse 2, Until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So he he, he has an introduction to Acts, but it's not as extensive as what we find in the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> and everything that we find in the intro to Acts ties into the Gospel, especially into the last couple chapters. So this preface sort of serves for both the works, but primarily for his Gospel. The preface in relation to the rest of the Gospels. If you read Luke's Gospel and then read the other Gospels and see how they are introed, we have the genealogical table in Matthew. We have the concise opening sentence of Mark. And Mark's sort of that way. He likes to just sort of speed things along. A very Romanistic sort of style. Let's just get to the point. And so he starts off with his opening sentence and he just keeps moving. And, and you can sense the movement. If you read Mark's Gospel from beginning to end, you sense the movement throughout the Gospel. Then you have with John's Gospel, the contemplation of the eternal word in his prologue. But here, Luke's introduction stands out from all the rest. Again, he states his purpose up front, but he does it in such a way <clears throat> that he's making very clear what he's trying to do here. We have the structure of the preface. And this I wanted to show you because it's, a, it's an actually it's a very beautiful sentence. And in some senses, very Jewish, but yet it's very, very Greek. But notice this, Luke's gospel begins with a literary prologue, or what is called a period. It ranks among the best Greek literature of the first century. This is a quote from BDF, if you will, and their, and their grammar on Greek, which is generally judged to be the best stylized sentence in the whole New Testament. This is one long sentence composed of two equal parts, and we'll look at it, I'll, I'll present the, the, the verses up for you and just so you can get an idea of the structure of it in the Greek. But this is one long sentence composed of two equal parts and his gospel is presented to us as a very human composition, but at the same time this is no less the Word of God. And this is interesting because when we begin to think about inspiration, oftentimes you know, the idea comes that you know, when God <clears throat> revealed His Word to these who were writing or led them along, you think of sort of like this dictation that God just said, okay, I want you to write, here's the first five words, you write these words, and then, you know, whoever was writing, whether it was Paul, Peter, or Luke, sat down and just wrote whatever God dictated to them, and that's not so. They used their personalities, you can see their personalities in the writings, you can see their education, if you will, in their writings. And from this preface in, in Luke's gospel, we can tell that Luke was a very educated man. We also know from Colossians that he was a physician, so he was no slub when it came to, to you know, education, but you can see his upbringing, if you will, in the writing of this first part of this gospel. The period which is known for its well-ordered organization of considerable number of clauses and phrases into a well-rounded unity is rare in the New Testament. But Luke's gospel begins with the beautifully constructed period. There is no other book in the New Testament that begins such as this. It exhibits moderate length of members and a beautiful relationship between the protasis, which is the dependent part of a sentence, with its three members and the corresponding structure of the apotesis, which is the independent part. And again, some of this may just seem like, well, whatever. What does that mean to me? I just want you to see the beauty of what's here. Because you don't always see it in the English translation. But I want you to see there's a difference here between the beginning of Luke's gospel and what follows, even from chapter 1, verse 5. There's a total change within the grammar itself. He goes from a very secularized, if you will, styled Greek, a very literary styled Greek in verses 1 through 4. Verse 5, everything is Hebraisms all the way through to the end of chapter 2. Why? Because it's a very Jewish context. And all that he is dealing with has to do with Judaism. So right from verse 4 to verse 5, the total style of his writing changes. But notice this. 
It's a very simple sentence. It's very balanced, but it's, it's beautifully arranged for us. Here's the sentence. If I put it in order in relationship to its different members, here's the, the dependent part, if you will. This is the independent part. And normally this would come after. But even the arrangement as he places this up here, the causal part of the sentence, he places it first. He's making a point. But notice this. <clears throat> And I'll give it to you in English. In verse 1, this is many. It seemed to me corresponds to the many. Here we have to write an orderly account. This corresponds to those who had previously tried to organize or arrange a narrative, if you will. Here you have the statement of that you may know the certainty, as he talks to, to Theophilus. Here he talks about those who were the eyewitnesses from the beginning. So there's this beautiful balance between these elements of this sentence, and Luke puts it all together, but he is making a point with the structure that he uses, but also with the terms that he uses. And we will begin to now look at what he writes in this preface to his gospel, but all the way through here, he is establishing the fact that he is writing historical fact, not fiction. Notice the mention of his predecessors in chapter 1, verse 1. He says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile account of the things accomplished among us. He is going to give the motivation or justification for his writing. <clears throat> and it's interesting, if you, if you just read this, he doesn't mention himself. He doesn't give his name in the preface whatsoever. It's very simple. And yet, at the same time, it's very beautiful and complex grammatically. But it's interesting to me that he just takes such a humble stance in writing this gospel. He doesn't claim himself to be an eyewitness, which proves the, 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 the truthfulness of his writing. Because he doesn't exalt himself in any way, he doesn't put himself out there. It's very simple. He stands in the background. He just wants all of us to know the facts. Notice this, the first statement. This statement is no mere exaggeration when he talks about the fact that many have undertaken to compile account. He's not exaggerating here, but he doesn't give us a specific number, and some try to argue that we can determine from this there is a specific number of, of narratives that were out there you know, floating around among the members of the church and among Christianity, but Luke doesn't give us the exact number, but he just makes a statement that many had taken to hand to compile these narratives. <clears throat> this statement was made to establish his president. Again, he was justifying his reason for taking pen in hand to write this narrative or this account of the words and works of Jesus Christ. And so he's establishing his attempt on the works of previous people. <clears throat> but he also tells us several things by this statement of the fact that many have done this. First, he tells us of the great importance of what they had recorded. They were recording the words and works of Christ as they were passed down to them. He's also establishing by this term that there was a considerable interest in these things. People wanted to know. Those who were the eyewitnesses, chapter 1, verse 2, were handing these things down. Others wanted to know, and there were those who wanted to preserve these things and pass them on to others. The other thing that we understand from this is that there was an extensive activity in the production of what we call them these rudimentary narratives. Luke says that many have taken into hand to try and attempt to put together a narrative to pass along to others, to preserve that which is being handed down by those who are eyewitnesses and servants of the Word. The context seems to indicate that these many were not eyewitnesses. And it's interesting because Luke sets himself in the context with these others who made attempts at writing out these narratives when he says, verse 2, just as they were handed down to us. So he also puts himself in the category of them that what that he had received what they had received, that he was not himself an eyewitness, he was not a servant of the Word, and yet he is a servant of the Word in the sense that he is recording these truths to be preserved for others to read and to know. But notice this, he will talk about their actuality, and again, when he makes a statement of fact that there was many who had undertaken to compile and account the things accomplished among us, he wasn't exaggerating when he said many have done this, and he establishes their actuality by making the statement in verse 1, of chapter 1, when he says, as much as many have undertaken to compile an account. He uses a term here, and he begins with a very stately opening, and it's a very classical word, and this is fascinating. This is the only word, the only time this word occurs in all the New Testament. It doesn't even occur in the Septuagint. This compound is rare occurrence, not only New Testament Septuagint, we find it in such writers as Thucydides, which, and other Attic writers, if you will, Dionysius, Josephus uses it as an introduction to war. 
This is, again, a term that was used by literary writers, historians, if you will, as they would introduce their work. Their work. This is not found anywhere else in all the New Testament or Septuagint. To me, things like that are fascinating. Because when you think about it, you realize this word and this word only would suffice for what Luke was trying to communicate. No other word would do. It was this word and this word alone. And it's a very interesting word, and I put up here for the makeup of it, it's made up of three different particles. And basically, it is used in reference to a fact that is already well known. So when he talks about the fact that many have undertaken to compile an account, this is a well-known fact. This is not fiction. This can be affirmed by many out there, right, as Luke writes this account. But it's made up of three particles. The particles are blended into one word, implying that the fact to be stated is one first well-known, it is important, and is important as a reason for undertaking on hand. So when Luke makes a statement that many have undertaken to compile these accounts, this is not fiction, this is a fact. This is a factual statement. And everything that follows is going to be fact. So Luke, when he talks about his predecessors, he doesn't look upon them in a negative way or disparagingly, which some have argued, Eusebius writes, that that, that was Luke's intent here. But there is no negativity. If you read, just simply reading the English, you know, the first four verses, we see that he's not being negative when he looks at his predecessors. What he does is he's using them positively, if you will. He is basing his own work upon what they have already done. He is using them as an example for what he is going to do. And he joins himself in their ranks when he says in verse 3, it seemed fitting for me as well, right? Along with these others, it seemed fitting for me as well to write an account or to put together a narrative, if you will. Notice this, their attempts then. He makes a statement. They have undertaken to compile an account. <clears throat> couple things. First, the compilation. The term that he uses here, and it's translated in the NASB, have undertaken. This word, have undertaken, it's found only in Luke's writings in the New Testament. Again, fascinating. Many of the words that we find in the first four verses are used nowhere else in the New Testament. Many of them aren't even used in the Septuagint. So these are very unique words to make the point that Luke wants to make. So if someone in that time was reading this in Greek, they would understand very clearly Luke's point with his preface. That when I come and talk to you about the fact that Gabriel came down from the presence of God to bring this message to Zacharias, guess what? That's fact, not fiction. When Gabriel came to Mary to tell her that she as a virgin is going to conceive this child by the working of the Holy Spirit, guess what? That's fact, not fiction. And what's interesting to me is that when we read through the account last week and we looked at when Abel, Angel Gabriel comes down to Zacharias and Mary, it's fascinating. Luke doesn't take the time to explain angels or defend their existence or even prove their existence. He just states it simply. Matter of fact, they exist. And some say, well, he records it from God's perspective. And that may very well be true. And when I started thinking about it, I thought, you know what? I need to start thinking about things from God's perspective. So oftentimes we are put on the defense in regards to our faith in relation to the rest of the world. And we are felt like here, you know, God is put under the microscope of man somehow that God needs to be dissected and picked apart and somehow we need to prove his existence. His existence is proved by everything that, around, that is around us. It's sufficient. It's sufficient to condemn man, Paul says in Romans, yes. But it's amazing that he doesn't make any attempts whatsoever to explain these things, to defend them. He just states it as a matter of fact. This is so. <clears throat> he says that they had put their, their hand to, if you will, and it means to put the hand to, take in hand or attempt. Now, <clears throat> sometimes people think when you understand it in relation to attempt that somehow there is an idea of failure involved here, that somehow Luke was saying that those who had gone before him had somehow failed and miserably, and therefore he is going to pick up their slack, if you will. 
But you need to understand when he uses this term to take in hand or have undertaken, although it expresses the idea of an attempt made, it does not express success or failure. That comes from the context and not from the word. And when we read this context, we see very clearly that there is no negativity involved in this when Luke talks about his predecessors. So he's not mentioning them in regards to any kind of failure they had. He's just making mention of the fact that they had attempted to take that which was passed on to them and to put it into a narrative. He says that they had put their hand to draw up again and order a narrative or to arrange afresh so as to show the sequence of events or leading through to the end. So this is what they did as those things were passed on to them, if you will, from those who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. They tried to take these things and compile them into a narrative. The idea then is the expression points to the, to the fact of a connected series of narratives arranged in some order rather than isolated in narratives. In other words, it's just like the other Gospels that we have and what Luke attempts to do and what Luke has done has been preserved for us is that they would take that which was passed down and they wanted to take the stories and the words and deeds of Christ and put them in some sort of order, if you will. So what's fascinating to me is that you sort of see this process. Now, we don't know this is the process that happened with all the other Gospels that were written, but we can see that this was the process for, for Luke as he wrote his Gospel, that there were others out there who were taking, and more than likely, much of what was passed on was done orally, although the term for being passed on is a technical term in verse 2, can refer to also written right tradition that's passed on. But nonetheless, they try to take these things and put them into an order, into a narrative, if you will to preserve what Christ had taught and the things that he had done. Notice the content of this. <clears throat> he says in the second part of verse 1, he says that many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us. These are the things that have been, if you will, carried through to the end. And this is the term that Luke uses here. The things which have been accomplished are fully established. This is our term right here which is, is a perfect passive participle. The perfect tense implies a process having reached a consummation and is in an existing or finished state, if you will. The passive element, the passive voice, it reflects that God is the one who brought these events to fulfillment. <clears throat> and these events being, if you will, they are in the state of completion, Luke says. These are the divine actions, and without a doubt, these are things that are worthy of a historical narrative that Luke records here for us. And again, he is attempting to record the same thing, the things accomplished among us. But all the way through here, he is highlighting the fact that these are the things that God has fulfilled. So even though, and times we'll see this in Luke's Gospel, there are times when God's hand is directly stated. Other times, we will see that there is no indication specifically that God's hand in it is in it in the event, but nonetheless we see it's there. Notice with me. I mean, the first two chapters we saw God involved in it what, all the way through the process of the birth announcements to their births and so on, orchestrating all of the events, all the different characters. Everything was under the hand of God's sovereignty. But notice this. Notice with me in chapter 4, we have such statements as this. <clears throat> in chapter 4, Jesus is in Nazareth. And he comes to the synagogue as he always does. He reads from Isaiah, and we'll come and look at this passage more fully. I'll start in verse 24. And he says, And he said to them, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there are many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. Now notice what happens. And they got up and they drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which the city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. Now notice verse 30. But passing through their midst, he went his way. There's just very interesting statements that we find in Luke's gospel like that. Well, what happened? They're enraged. They take him outside the city. They're going to take him to the edge, and they're going to cast him off and die. And in the midst of this raging mob, he just passes through and goes on his way. Well, what happened? Notice with me. Chapter 24. <clears throat> 
And we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there, but just some thoughts. In chapter 24, we have the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. In chapter 24, verse 14, And they were talking with each other about these things which had taken place. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But notice this verse 16. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. This is an imperfect participle, passive in voice. Okay. Now notice what happens in the same chapter. Verse 31. I'll start in verse 30. And when he had reclined at the table, they, they beckoned Jesus to come with them. And so they go in and they're reclining at this table. And he took the bread and he blessed it. This is talking about Jesus. And breaking it, he began giving it to them. Notice verse 31. Then their eyes were opened, again, passive in voice, and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. There are going to be direct statements of God's hand in the events that are taking place. But then there are these statements that you just see God's hand involved or God's sovereign leading and God bringing these events to completion, not only in history, but in the lives of the people who were witnessing these events. And this statement goes for the whole gospel. It is what God has accomplished among us. He is the one who has brought these things to fulfillment. <clears throat> So this is the content, and this is the content of what Luke wants to present in his narrative as well. Notice the primary authorities in verse 2, because when he talks about those predecessors, those who had gone before him, he says, just as they were handed down to us from the beginning, who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So now he's going to talk about the primary authorities, and he establishes the reliability. First, they are the basis of, of the writings of those who wrote earlier before Luke attempts to write his gospel narrative. But they are also the ones who handed down the traditions, if you will, to Luke himself, not only to his predecessors, but to himself. They were very reliable. They were the primary authorities. They were, if you will, the from the beginning eyewitnesses. The grammar of this binds this all together, and really the whole thing is bind together <clears throat> the statement of the fact that they were from the beginning eyewitnesses and servants of the word. They had seen, they had heard, they had witnessed all of this themselves. And primarily he is talking about the twelve. Although what we have in the first two chapters more than likely was passed on to them by Mary herself. And again we have the, the, the statements in regards to Mary that she pondered these things. She treasured them in their heart. She was a very reflective young woman. And so she had treasured these things, pondered them, kept them in her heart, and then later would have passed them on to apostles who would then pass them on to others. And these are the ones that had passed them on to Luke's predecessors and Luke himself. They were the primary authorities, if you will. And then he mentions their relationship to the Word. And I isolate these two things. They go together. First he establishes the reliability, but then the relationship to the Word. And I isolate this for this reason. He mentions the fact that they were servants of the Word. This to me is a very amazing statement. This statement reflects the fact it conveys the thought that the centrality of the gospel message and the way in which these were its servants. To me, it's awesome. And, and the term that he uses here for servanthood, Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians as he describes himself in Apollos. This term was used of an under rower on a ship. In those days, you'd have a ship, they would have sails, but they would also have under rowers who were under the, the, the main deck, and they were down in the hull of the boat, and they had oars, right? If the winds weren't blowing, they would be, you know, and oftentimes slaves and prisoners, they would be chained to these oars and they would row. This is the term that is used here. They were under rowers. They served the word. They served the gospel and they served it with their lives. To me, that's very fascinating to me as a minister and a, and a, and a, and a believer because there are so many out there who are using the gospel to serve themselves. Here, Luke makes a statement, these who were eyewitnesses served the word. They served the gospel, and they gave their lives for it. And they sacrificed much for it. But it was all about the gospel for them. It was the centrality of the gospel. It emphasizes the fact that we're not propagandists of their own views of what happened with Jesus, but had unreservedly put their persons and work in the service of Jesus. Jesus. 
Luke says, this is who he received it from. They weren't trying to accomplish anything. They weren't trying to establish anything for themselves. And it's interesting because, you know, sometimes you hear the statement that, well, man created religion so that he can hold other men in his grasp. But that's not how these men were. They served the gospel. It didn't serve them, and it wasn't their invention. It wasn't their views, right? It wasn't their, their stories and, and their mere speculations on Jesus Christ. They were passing along fact to others. It did not serve them, but they served it. And it was a very fascinating statement to me in regards to that. And we see that in Colossians with Paul's life as well, right? Paul was a man who served the gospel, and he gave his life for it without a doubt. Notice the personal qualifications now. Luke is going to move into verse 3, and he's going to give sort of these prerequisites. And this oftentimes would come in historical works and the prefaces to them that the writer would establish. These are the qualities by which I can write this narrative, if you will, or this historical document. So Luke gives these qualities, but they also establish motivations for him. So he's going to express his desire, and he's going to join himself with his predecessors. And he says in verse 3, It seemed fitting to me as well having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. So one, he expresses his desire, but he's also going to establish the fact that he, this is further, further motivation for why he writes this narrative. <clears throat> but it's interesting, he uses this construction. The similar construction is found, somewhat similar to what Luke uses. Here is Luke's construction that he uses here in the Gospel. This was used by Dionysius when he wrote in about 20 B.C., who was a Greek scholar, and in his introduction he was writing after the fact of, of talking about a discussion on uh, some Roman archaeology works that were put out. And so he is writing in reference to that after already discussing that. He uses similar phrasing, so Luke uses that here. The phrasing that Luke uses neither implies nor denies inspiration. I mention that because there are some old Latin manuscripts that contain the statement of and the Holy Spirit. So it was inserted in the text, and it says in verse 3, And it seemed fitting to me as well, and to the Holy Spirit, having invested everything carefully. Because, the, the, you know, again, we want to affirm that this is divine inspiration. It wasn't just a human composition. We know that it's divinely inspired. That it wasn't just merely human composition. But nonetheless, it, it, we cannot insert those things in the text if it's not there. And the beautiful thing is we see and gain an understanding in the process of inspiration that God used the very uniquenesses of the writers who wrote whether Paul, Peter, or Luke, or anyone else, right? He used their uniquenesses, their talents, their gifts that were given by him, even their education, in this case with Luke, in the process of preserving his word. Luke used all available human means and methods so as to present an exact and well-arranged account of the occurrences. And we see this in the statements that follow. Notice this as he moves on in verse 3. It seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully. So now he gives his qualifications. First, he makes a statement of the fact that he made a careful investigation. This is an interesting word. It means to follow closely or accompany. Metaphorically, it means to follow or to trace or to investigate. In other words, what Luke is saying here is he's not presenting himself as contemporaneous with the events, but he says that he brought himself side by side with these events by careful investigation. So all the existing writings that, that were done by these many that he refers to in verse 1, and those things that have been passed down, Luke brings himself abreast of them, and he has investigated them, and he has researched them out, he has studied them out, and then he is going to make or write his narrative based on that. He followed through, if you will, he followed through mentally. He investigated to trace the course of events, to trace them down by research. And again, all of this is a part of the process of inspiration, the preserving of God's Word. This is a perfect participle, which is interesting because it means that Luke did this before he started writing. He investigated everything. All right? He investigated everything that was there. He goes on to say that he did it carefully. He did all of this before he even began to write his narrative. Notice this. He went back to the commencement. In other words, he went back to the beginning. From the first, he says, I did this. And he is the only one who records the conceptions of John and Jesus. He also says that he was thorough. He says, I investigated everything. He had examined all available data with a fixed purpose in order to be able to give as detailed a rendering as might be necessary. 
Now this is interesting. This is, a, this is a fact. If you read through Luke's Gospel and then the other Gospels and compare them, you'll find out that there are things contained within Luke's Gospel that are not in the other Gospels. You turn to chapter 9, verse 51, and, the, and that section from 951 to the beginning of chapter 19, 60% of what's contained in that section is not found in the other Gospel writers. And none of them go back to the birth announcement of John or Jesus. Many of the parables that we call, have from Christ, many of the miracles and so on, these are things that are not recorded in any of the other Gospels we find only in Luke himself. So without a doubt, he is the most thorough of Gospel writers, if you will. Notice he was very careful. His research was done with exactness, if you will. And then he comes to the statement of the fact that now he is going to write. He claims or he aims at a careful communication. He says, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. Now it's interesting that we have the translation here in consecutive order. What is he talking about? Here's the term that he uses here. It's built up of two words. We have kata, which is down, and then we have in order or successively and next. In other words, it's describing an orderly account as one in which one says next what should be said next. It is an account which is not confused or haphazard. In other words, it is to place in order one after another in sequence, whether in regards to time, space, or logic. Primarily, he's dealing with chronological order, and we see this. He begins with the, the announcement of John the Baptist's conception, then of Jesus, right? Then we have the birth, and we can see that it's in chronological order. Even the time references we have in 1.5 and then in chapter 2 and chapter 3, we can see that he is aiming at chronological order. But notice this with me. Turn with me to chapter 3 in your, in your Gospel of Luke. In chapter 3, John begins his ministry, but I want you to notice something. He is out there baptizing, people are coming. <clears throat> But notice this statement in chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. It says, Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized, and while He was praying, heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended upon Him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came out of heaven, You are my beloved Son, and in You I am well pleased. What's interesting about this is, in the previous section, it's talking about John's ministry begins, people are coming out, he's baptizing him. This makes a statement that Christ came out at that same time and was baptized by John. But notice what happens at the end of the episode of John's ministry. We have a summary statement. Verse 18, So with many other exhortations he preached the gospel to the people, but when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod also added this, to them all. He locked John up in prison. This happened much later in John's life and ministry, but Luke puts it here because here it's just he sort of gives us summary statement. This is where John ends up later, but now we're going to set him aside. Now the focus is moving to Jesus and it's going to be on Jesus. And in this case, he breaks with that chronological order. And there are going to be points within his gospel that he does so. So primarily he's aiming at chronological order, but where it is, he is, finds it necessary to deal with things, whether thematically or logically, he does so. So, so <clears throat> the word is left for us. We, we've given the statement of the fact that he's going to write things in consecutive order, but he doesn't specify exactly is it completely chronological, is it completely logical, or what have you. But notice this. This word, having done all of this, this is the outcome of it, a careful communication to Theophilus. Here's the purpose. The person he writes to is Theophilus. Just a little bit of background. He calls him most excellent. This, you'll learn in Greek, is vocative. This is a rare case we find pure vocative, but this is it. Most, he says, most noble, most excellent honorary form of address used in regards to persons who hold a higher official or social position than the speaker. So when he refers to Theophilus, he calls him most excellent. What is he referring to here? Is it because he just has a higher social position or is it an official position? And I would hold that it's an official position. This title is used only here and in Acts, and in these places in Acts, it's an official title used addressing the procurator of Judea in Acts, and therefore, in this case, it is also used in the same way as an official designation for Theophilus. He was an official of some sort of standing. Some think because his name means lover of God, or that, that you know, Luke is actually writing to the church, but that's not so. Well, I would say it's not, but you can 
choose to do otherwise. The purpose of the writing is this. He says, verse 4, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Luke now moves to the purpose. After establishing all of all of his predecessors, the fact that what they had received was from eyewitnesses, it is reliable, it is solid, it is historical fact. These are, are things that have been accomplished by God. Now he establishes, this is my purpose, so that you would know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. In other words, Luke wanted Theophilus to have an additional, more thorough knowledge, and this is the term that he uses here, that you may know, that you may know fully, and understand completely, if you will, and have a more thorough knowledge of the things that you have received. Notice this, and it's interesting because you can't see this in English, but the Greek text, it ends with the statement of certainty. The word means firmness, certainty, or reliability. In other words, I put this thought up here, by his method of presentation, Luke wishes to show Theophilus that reliable information was contained in the accounts which he had already received. In other words, that he, what he embraced was an impregnable historical foundation. It was rooted on fact. This is not fiction. And there may be an apomical element in this. In other words, there may have been heretics who were out there who were disputing what had, Theophilus had received, and they may have been disputing what was being passed around in these narratives that were compiled and passed on, questioning their, their validity and their reliability and stating it that they were not truth. And so Luke is affirming to Theophilus that what you have received is truth. It is fact. And you have this firm foundation upon which to rest. And here's a thought I had in relation to this, and I find it very interesting. The unique characteristic of Christianity is that it is based on the definite historical facts and not on speculations and theories. To me, that is resting to my soul. To me, that is resting to my soul. If you will, oftentimes it just anchors my faith down. When the world mocks, when the world scoffs, when the world calls into question the things that we believe, I can refer back to these statements and know that what I believe is true. And it is factual. And when the world tries to dismiss the reality of Christ, we know that when He walked the face of this earth, it was in reality. Notice this. I want to show you something real quickly, and we end with this. The motivation and purpose of his writing being fulfilled. We see he makes a statement of writing things in order and that he may know for certain. And so we see in the first two chapters, we'll see that Luke carries out this purpose. And just to go through the first couple of chapters real quickly, just walk with me. He talks about giving an orderly account. Notice how he does this. First, Luke begins his narrative by providing a carefully organized account of the things that have been fulfilled among us after stating that he desired to do this. Notice what he does. He begins with God visiting his people. Zacharias talks about this in chapter 1, verse 16, that he has visited his people and he has accomplished redemption for them. And he has done this in the miraculous births of the Messiah's forerunner and the Messiah. So Luke begins this orderly account with the conceptions and births of the forerunner and the Messiah. Luke began his orderly account with a careful paralleling of the events associated with the birth of the coming of John and the birth of the coming of Jesus. And if you read through the first two chapters, you will see that parallelism that goes on. But notice this. We've seen this before we walk through this. Notice the accounts with Zacharias and Mary. The same angel Gabriel appeared to Zacharias and Mary. Both were troubled by angelic visit. Both were told not to be afraid. Both were told of the future birth of the Son. Both births were associated with the work of the Holy Spirit. In both passages, the angel gave the name for the Son. In both, the angel stated that the Son would be great. In both, the Son's future roles in God's plan were announced. In both, we are told the birth, circumcision, and naming of the sons. And in both, the opening and concluding sections of this whole beginning section of the Gospel accounts takes place in the temple, which gives us an inclusion and it brackets this whole section off, and it makes it one whole entire unit. Luke was accomplishing what he said he wanted to do to write an orderly account for Theophilus. And it's beautiful. If you read through the first two chapters, it's like a hymn. It really is. And, and before we went through each section, you know, section by section, we saw the beauty of the hymns. But if you look at it as a whole even, it's just one beautiful hymn of fact. And some, someday we'll look at the, the grammar of it. But notice this, that you may know the certainty, he says to Theophilus. Notice this. In this section, Luke reveals his meaning to Theophilus in several different ways. If you read through the first two chapters, these are some of the things that Luke does to establish his first 
He establishes through the hymns and prophecies of various authoritative spokespersons. Their hymnic and prophetic pronouncements declare the divinely ordained coming of the Messiah and His forerunner and the future roles and work, which are fulfilled, and we see this in His Gospel. The reliability of these pronouncements, though, notice, is, is, is in their character. How do we know that what is taking place and what is being said is reliable? You know it because of the character of the people that are in these episodes. So when he makes his statement about Zacharias and Elizabeth, that they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord, we can know for certain that whatever takes place with them and whatever they say is reliable because of the character that they had. Right? It's like if you go into a courtroom and you're trying to build a case and your only witness is a convicted felon. He's, con you know, he's convicted of m many misdemeanors, a couple felonies. Here you bring him into court, you put him on the stand, he's going to testify and he's going to be the basis of your case. How many people in the jury do you think are going to believe a convicted felon? Someone whose life is marked by crime and dishonesty and theft. Well, not likely are they going to believe that individual. You place someone like Zacharias and Elizabeth on, right, up front to, to give testimony, well, look at the character of their life. Look at what they're like. I'm going to be more likely to believe them than I'm going to believe the convicted felon. And this is the beauty of this passage. Notice those who are mentioned. First, you have the angel Gabriel and the angels, the multitude of heavenly hosts in chapter 2. The pronouncements that come from them. You have the upright priest, Zacharias. You have the upright Elizabeth. You have the highly favored Mary. You have the righteous and devout prophet Simeon. And of course, Mary was a virgin which was a miracle unparalleled in the Old Testament. With Elizabeth's case, that was paralleled. You had barren women who were, who were unable to conceive, right, Sarah? Unable to conceive, but nonetheless, their children didn't turn out like John the Baptist, but they had their unique roles like John the Baptist. But Mary was a virgin. This was a miracle unheard of in Old or New. The righteous and devout prophet Simeon. And then we have Anna in the temple. And we'll talk about both of them next time. But notice also through the numerous allusions to the Old Testament Scriptures. Not only does he ground these things in, in the history of the time with Herod the Great and the other uh, historical notations in chapter 2 and chapter 3, but he grounds all of these things in the history of the Old Testament. And they're all a fulfillment of what, what God had declared in the, in the covenants to His people. But notice this. We have barrenness followed by miraculous birth and special divine mission for the child. This is parallel in the Old Testament. We have a birth announcement parallel in the Old Testament, reference to the angel Gabriel, Old Testament. The appearance of the prophet and divine revelation, the same in the Old Testament. Various other allusions to the Old Testament come within this section. Over and over, he's showing the certainty of what happens, not merely grounding in the historical facts of the time, but also in the history of the Old Testament. And if you will, even the History Channel today still acknowledges that the Old Testament is history. All right? Notice this. Also through the repetition of important themes, and again, these things were promises made by God in the Old Testament that came to fulfillment. We can be certain of the things that you have received because these things are so. God promised, God fulfilled. Notice some of the themes, the divine promises having been fulfilled all the way through this section. God having sent His Son, the Messiah, to Israel, which He promised to do in all. The Messiah being born of a virgin. Isaiah, the Spirit's being active once again in Israel. God seeking the downtrodden in the presence of joy of salvation. Over and over, Luke is going to establish his purpose. He's going to do it all the way through the gospel. He's going to show that I'm writing an orderly account and I'm writing so that you may know for certain what you have received. The beautiful thing is when we read this introduction, don't just pass by it, but understand what Luke is trying to establish here. Your faith rests on fact. And Jesus is the all-important fact. And for us as Gentiles, He is the light of revelation to us. He is the revelation from God to us. He is the all-important fact that opens our eyes to who God is. But notice this, the certainty of what was received. We have an impregnable historical foundation to our faith. Amen? Amen. Amen.